بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته First of all I would like to sincerely apologize for not having this session last Thursday We had some technical difficulties and really what that technical difficulties means is I wasn't available so I don't want to blame our Miftah team our, they were always available it's just me I couldn't come on time and um, complete this session so I hope all of you can forgive me for that Secondly, all the comments and suggestions that are coming on YouTube and Facebook, I've been reading them. Inshallah, we will have a dedicated session for that um, to answer those questions and just give some feedback on those. So please keep them coming. Um, I'm benefiting from them and I'm sure everyone else will benefit from them when we get to elaborate on those. Today's session will be dedicated to an individual from the family of the Prophet wasallam. He was an individual who was there 50 years after the Prophet left this world. Just 50 years after the Prophet left this world. 50 to 51 years. We all know what happened in Karbala. Today, this is Muharram, right? Muharram, today is Muharram 22nd, I believe. And so on the 10th of Muharram, we all you know, read or heard what happened. And, this, this, and this trage- these tragic events can always bring, they always bring a tear to the eye of a believer. And it's so hard for me to speak about it actually. But during this event, there were Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he had four sons and two daughters. So there was Ali Akbar, the older brother, the Ali Akbar. He was Shaheed in Karbala. And then you had Abd- Abdullah, <clears throat> he was an infant in the lap of Hussein radiallahu anhu when he was like at that point in Karbala, in the Battle of Karbala, when he saw his entire family, all the male folks of the family martyred in front of him, saw everyone that was supporting him, there were, there, the bodies were laying on the ground, and he knew this was his final moments of this, in this life. So he asked the, the women folks who sent his baby who was crying in the tent outside, and um, he held his son Abdullah, who was at that time still, an in, he was still a toddler actually, and some say he was only a few months old, some say he was a year old, but he was a baby nevertheless. And he held him in his lap, kissing him, smelling him, you know, you know how, how much love we have for these ch- children at that age. And as he was doing that, as he was having this moment, this final moment with his son, uh, one f- enemy from the enemy line um, sent, uh, sh- shot an arrow directed to the head of this baby and this child passed away in the arms of Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu and this was his son Abdullah so that's his second son Abdullah and then he had a son by the name of Ja'far who had no children and then he had a son by the name of Ali ibn al-Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib Allah anhu he was known as Ali Asghar the younger Ali because he had Hussein one who had two children by the name of Ali the elder one was Ali al-Akbar, known as Ali al-Akbar, and the other one was Ali al-Asghar. So, and Ali al-Asghar was then famously known as Imam Zain al-Abidin, rahimahullah. Um, Zain al-Abidin, the adornment of the worshippers, right? So that's what he was, that, that, that was his nickname, and that's what he was known as. He was also there in Karbala. But he was extremely sick. He was about 23 years old at this time, extremely sick, bedridden, People had thought that he would not survive just out of his sickness. So he's the only survivor of the children, of the boys from Hussein Lanhu. Even him, Shimr, one of the enemies, comes inside the tent attempting to kill him even though he, was, he couldn't even move his limbs. He was so sick. And uh, at that point, the enemies told their leader, Shimr, hey, what's wrong with you? Like, this guy is sick. Don't you have any shame? Like, you're going to attack a defenseless person who's sick, who's laying on his bed, leave him alone. And he's the only adult that's left with these females. Leave him, maybe he will take care of them. So that's why he was left. And, you know, second time he had a scare, a death scare, was when he, when he was presented, the, the Ahl al-Bayt, the family of was presented in front of um, Ibn Ubaidullah bin Ziyad. And he asked, what's your name? And he said, my name is Ali. He said, oh, didn't, I, didn't we kill Ali already? And he says, no, that, he stayed quiet. And then he asked the question again, hey, didn't we already kill Ali? And he, the, the, um, Ali bin Hussein, Imam Zal Abidin, stays quiet. Then he asked again. Then Imam Zal Abidin says, yes, you did. But that was my older brother. I'm also Ali. Right? 
So he says, oh, he said to him, boastingly, he says, look, we killed him. And, um, and Ali ibn Hussein, Imam Zal Abdin stays quiet. Again, he boasts in his face, look, we did this and we did that. And uh, then Ali ibn Hussein, he says, وَمَا كَانْ لَفْسٍ أَنْ تَمُوتَ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ there's no soul can taste death except from the, the will and the permission of Allah. So you don't kill anybody. When a person leaves this world, that's, it's, that's his or her time. No one can bring death closer or, or, bring, or, or push death further. And he mentions this. And Zayn al-Abidin, when he said this, um, he, uh, Ubaidah bin Ziyad, who's a um, you know, great oppressor, he was, he was bothered by this. You know, a tyrant doesn't like when you speak in front of him. That's, what, that's, the, that's the quality of tyrants. And he said he was really mad that he spoke back and everyone heard what he said. So he said, I'm going to kill you too. So Imam Zina Abidin, and he was about to be killed at that time. Um, he said, look, if you're going to kill me, just make sure you send somebody who is pious, righteous, that can take these females back to Medina. Because I'm the only family member of the Prophet left alive. When he, Ubaid al was about to do this, then the sister of Hussein by the name of Zainab, who is the Puppo, we call Puppo, um, the elder sister of Hussein, Puppo, um, she, in Urdu we say that, she jumped on Hussein and she looked towards Abdul Ubaid al-Maziyad and she says, she says um, have some mercy on this child, he's sick and he's the only one that we have. And if you're going to kill him, you better kill me first. And that's Ubaid al-Maziyad said, all right, you know, let this kid go. And then he was sent back to Medina after st- um, stopping off with, uh, in front of Yazid. He goes back to Medina and he lives there. This, this child then grows older and he would always cry in his salah. He would cry so much in his salah. And um, people asked him, why do you cry so much? And he says, don't you see the story of Yaqub a.s. He lost one son and he cried so much that he became blind. I lost my entire family. And they died right in front of my eyes. And he says, you know, that makes me, that makes me tear up, you know. It makes me cry because I think about them. So this child, you know, he survives. And he becomes this, a very righteous, he, of course, from the family of the Prophet uh, his, he becomes, this, he, 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 when you hear his stories and read about him, you say, subhanAllah, what a person. So of course, I'm not going to, this series is not about highlighting individuals, but people don't know enough about him. That's why I'm just, it's just dedicating a few minutes of my, uh, today's session towards this and then there's one specific story I want to mention about him and his mother that's what this, story, this, this series is about right um, the, how the respect and honor that these great individuals who had all the honor in the world had for their parents for their mothers and fathers like today what happens is children get fame we become famous or become doctors engineers ulama whatever it is we get some, but then as we grow older and we become less dependent on our parents we also become more distant from our parents when we were dependent on them, we couldn't do anything without them, then we were always with them. And then as you see, parents say, as the child gets his license, and you know they get their cell phone, they start going out, then the time that the child is spending decreases and decreases and decreases. And this is a tragedy of our times. These people were not close to, they didn't have friends. They did not, didn't just have friends. They, didn't have, they were the best people to walk on the face of the earth after the Prophet ﷺ. But they still were humble enough to sit in front of their mother and father knowing that there's no one better than them in my life. It doesn't matter how great I get, this is the greatest person in my life. This person, doesn't matter how much people respect me, this person deserves all my respect. So this, think about this, imagine, you know, the amount of respect this person had once he comes to uh, Mecca for Hajj. At that time, there was this one, um, the Khalifa, his name was Hisham bin Abdul Malik. And he was trying to find his way to kiss the Hajar Aswad. We know how difficult it is to kiss the Hajar Aswad. The king at that time was trying to find his way to kiss the Hajar Aswad and no one was making room for him. And all of a sudden this brilliant, handsome young person, you know I say handsome for a reason because one thing I love about him, he used to wear nice clothes. So he was a worshipper, he was this, but he used to dress nice, wear nice clothes, wear the best perfume. He used to wear white imama with his, you know, this part behind his shoulder blades like this. And people, he used to walk around and he said, Qul man ibadihi. It's like, say, who can make beautification, adornment, impermissible, that which Allah has given you. That adornment and beautification that Allah has made permissible, 
who can make it haram? It's permissible. So he used to dress nicely, very elegantly. And that's what I, you know, when, I, when you read about every youngster and every individual can read about these great people and find something that, that's relevant to them. And then, you know what, this, person's, this person seems pretty cool. You know how we say in our language? This person seems pretty, you know, like this. So he, was, he comes to Mecca. And when Hisham Abdul Malik was denied entry into, to, to, you know, to kiss the Hajar Aswad, he walks in. As soon as he walks in, everyone moves out of the way. Everyone. And he just goes and kisses the Hajar Aswad with no pushing, no shoving. Everyone just moved out of the way. When they moved out of the way, there was an entourage with the king. So one guy who didn't know him, he's like, who's this guy? And he said, I'm like, I don't know, even though he knew. He refused to say who he was. At that time, there was a poet that was standing there. His name was Farazdaq. And that's why I love poetry, because if it wasn't captured in poetry, you would never know what, it, what happened that time, right? This Farazdaq was a great poet. He says, and he goes on. He says, do you, don't, do you don't know who this person is? This is that individual that every inch of Mecca in Arabia recognizes him. The Kaaba recognizes him. This is the, the child of the best person to ever walk on the face of the earth. This is the son of Fatima. If you don't know him, that <laughs> doesn't reduce this person's honor, but it reduces your honor. Who are you? You don't know this guy? This is the grandson of that prophet who was a seal of all prophets. He never in his life said no to anybody except for in tashahud. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. If it wasn't for tashahud, every, every, even his no's would have been yes. You know, what's interesting about that part is that he was an individual, when someone would come to him to ask him, he would say, Marhaba. You know when someone when someone comes for donations, we're like, oh man, he's here again. <laughs> someone stands up for a fundraiser? Oh no, another one? Anyone would come to ask him, he would say, welcome, welcome. Welcome to that person who's going to hold my amana and take it to Allah on the Day of Judgment. Who's going who's gonna, to you know, transfer my trust from here to Akhirah, knowing that this person was a means of barakah and blessing for him. When he passed away, they saw... On his back, they saw all these traces of, you know, of weight. He had all these marks as if he was to hold and carry so much burden on his shoulders, sacks of rice and food. So um, they said, what's, what's going on? We never seen him do that. He used to give during the day. People used to know about it. But at night, he used to carry provision and drop it off in, in front of people's homes. And no one knew he used to do that. He used to carry it himself. And after he passed away, the people that he used to feed didn't know who used to feed them. They used to see in the morning there was food there. There was money there. After he passed away, the people of Medina realized it was Imam Zilin Abidin. That he was the one who used to feed them. After all these virtues, how was he with his mother? And I'll just mention this story. Very short. People would never see him eating with his mother. Unless he would sit down with his mother in, in the most respectful manner. And, and his mother would eat in front of him and he would just put the food down for her. Make sure everything is perfect for her. Water is there, everything's there. I say this because youngsters nowadays have such bad eating habits with our parents. I remember uh, a mother complaining to me about how her son walks in at 2, 3 o'clock at night and she's diabetic and she has you know, a lot of health conditions so she prepares a, you know, some breakfast for herself that she's going to eat right when she wakes up in the morning. When she wakes up, you know, the, the food is, the fridge is open, everything is eaten and the dishes are left there and then she has to get up and you know, and now she has to prepare it again. A lot of times we don't even, we eat with our parents. We don't even think. We come home, we don't even think about our parents. And even if our parents are eating, we don't even think, okay, should I pre present my father or mother with food? Should I put the plate down? What else is, you know, before they even ask, knowing what they want, knowing exactly how they eat, what they eat, you know, in which manner they eat, what time they eat, so you're there for them so you can serve them. Remember, when you had no other provision in this world, the only one that could have fed you was your mother. And that's all you had to survive. And today, she's not asking you for anything. But just be there. And I, I just think, 
I mean, us youngsters in this country, maybe all over the world, we just have some really horrible eating habits, especially with our parents. And so we just, you know, we're very, it's like a selfish nature. We come, whenever we're hungry, we eat. Whenever we don't feel like eating, we, we don't even consider the person sitting next to us, even if it could be our parents. This person, Imam Zul Abidin Rahmanullah, would sit down on the tablecloth, put it down for his mother, put the food down, put everything down, and then he would pretend he would he would uh, pretend like he's eating. Now his mother is very old, and some say this was not even his biological mother, but rather this was his um, uh, foster mother. So he would sit with her and never eat though. He would never eat from the same plate as his mother. So somebody asked, Inna min nas bi ummik. He said, we see you, we consider you to be the most obedient, respectful son to a mother that the world has ever seen. But we never see you eating the same plate. That seems like an oxymoron. You're respectful, but you don't eat in the same plate. He says, He says, I fear that my hand would grab, just for, for, for example's sake, my hand would grab a, a portion of meat to eat. That same portion my mother looked at and she was just about to eat it, but since my hand went first, now she can't eat it, and I fear that this is enough to disobey my mother. This is enough to get the sin, the, the sin of, of disobedience and breaking ties with the parents so I don't do it, I don't eat, just because I'm afraid that she might want something and I might not be able to give it to her. Today our parents are not looking at things, they're telling us over and over and over again, we still don't do it. That's, he's just talking about his, her eyes just going towards that portion, uh, morsel and maybe I'll eat it before. And then he's considering that to be a major sin. Uquq al-walidin is the kabair, not a small mistake. A major sin, a major crime. Ajib. What would he say when if he were to see us today? What would he say if he were to see us receiving phone calls from our parents and just pretending like they're not calling and not picking up? What would he say to us if he were to see us receiving text messages from our mother and father but not responding in time because we're busy? We see it but we ignore it. What would he say to us? Would, it, would, would he not cry over the state of the ummah today? So I leave you with this message. That... Look at how they, these great people, treated their parents, how they sat with them, how they were so considerate even about their glance, that they wanted to make sure that, that I don't disobey my mother, that she might have wanted that and I took it. We know what our parents want, we, we don't do it. We know what they don't want and we still do it. Allah make us among those who are truly dutiful and respectful to our parents. And Allah honor our parents who took care of us all our lives. Jazakallah khair wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.